in the previous sections, we were talking about acid rain and how the East Coast is actually more acidic than what's typically the West Coast. Well, how we know this is because scientists use different measuring devices to determine the pH. This, for instance, is a pH meter. It gives the exact value of the pH of a solution. It provides much more specific information than a yes-no test of a litmus paper. This is litmus paper. If you dip part of it into the solution and it makes the red litmus paper turn blue, it's considered a base. If it's blue litmus paper and it turns red, that means it's an acid. They do not give an exact value, but it does give a simple yes-no exam, yes-no answer. The analysis of rain for specific compounds confirmed to the chief culprits are the oxides of sulfur and nitrogen. Sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, nitrogen monoxide, and nitrogen dioxide. These compounds are collectively designated SOX and NOX because those numbers change and are often referred to as SOX and NOX. As we discussed in global warming and the global warming and fuel chapters, burning fossil fuels also give sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. This is how sulfur oxides can be converted into acid rain. The sulfur dioxide and the sulfur trioxide combine with water and perform H2SO3 and H2SO4 respectively. With both of these compounds, hydrogen is given off, which is characteristic of the acids. Nitrous oxides form acids in the air as well, although it's a little bit more complicated. It once again reacts with both water, reacts with water, but it also reacts with oxygen itself. These two, three things, these three things come together to make nitric, nitric acid. Then once again, the hydrogen is donated, which is the, which is characteristic of acids. Sulfur dioxide emissions are highest in regions of many coal-fired electric power plants, steel mills, like in our area, and other heavy industries that rely on coal. Allegheny County in western Pennsylvania is just, is just such an area. In 1990, it led the United States in atmospheric SO2 concentration. There is, a dis there is a direct link between coal consumption and sulfur dioxide production. Most emissions arise from power plants that burn coal or fossil fuels. Since gasoline and diesel fuels contain relatively low amount of sulfur, transportation does not contribute much to the acid rain caused by the sulfur oxides. So fuel consumption is actually, or fuel combustion is actually the greatest. So how does the sulfur get into the atmosphere? Coal contain one to three percent sulfur. And coal burning power plants usually burn about one million metric tons of coal a year. Burning, is, burning of sulfur with oxygen produces sulfur dioxide, which is poisonous. Once in the air, the sulfur dioxide can react with, hydrogen, with oxygen molecules to form sulfur trioxide, which then acts in the formation of aerosols. The highest nitrous oxide emissions are generally found in states 
with large urban areas, high density populations, and heavy automo and auto heavy automo automobile traffic. Transportation sources such as motor vehicles, aircraft, and trains account for over half of the oxide emissions. Burning coal and fossil fuels for electric power plants take up over a third of the nitrogen oxide productions. Therefore, it's not surprising that the highest levels of atmospheric NO2 are measured over L.A. County, Los Angeles County, the car capital of the country. Nitrogen dioxide gas in the atmosphere reacts with hydroxyl radical to form nitric acid. In addition to the carbon, hydrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium, plants also need nitrogen to survive. Nitrogen is the only nutrient that is scarce in the ground. Therefore, we need to use fertilizers to help provide the plants with additional nitrogens. Plants need nitrogen in a chemical form that reacts more easily, such as ammonium ion, which is NH4 with a positive one charge. Ammonia, which is NH3, or the nitrate ion, which is NO3, with a negative one charge, in order to grow. These forms are easier for the plants to absorb, that easier to absorb than the nitrogen gas that is ordinarily in the air. There are bacteria near the roots of the plants that remove the nitrogen gas from the air and convert it to ammonia so the plants can use it. These are called nitrogen fixing bacteria. The nitrogen fixing is the conversion of N2 to NH4. Ammonium which is NH4, is then converted to nitrate, NO3 minus, in the nitrification, right here. The plants can then absorb the ammonium and nitrate ions. This excess the excess nitrate ions are then converted back to nitrogen gas, and then released back into the atmosphere by bacteria and the denitrification. This whole process is called the nitrogen cycle. Bacteria do not provide enough reactive nitrogen to supply the world with food, so synthetic fertilizers must be added. As the population of the world increases, we needed a way to provide more ammonia and nitrates to the soils for the cultivation of plants. The Haber-Bosch process, named for the scientists who created it, is the most commonly way to create ammonia. Notice once it was determined, it skyrocketed. This is our population right here. So out of all these three things combined, that's our total nitrogen. So the majority is coming from the Haber-Bosch process. Other ways include byproducts of fossil fuels, which are here, which is the lowest, and the cultivation of rice and legumes, featured into the CBNF production line but the Haber-Bosch process is by far the largest. These two graphs show the distribution of where the sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides come from for the past 70 years. Let's take a look at the sulfur oxides first. The majority of the population comes from fuel combustion, which is denoted by this aqua blue color. Also notice that the steady decline in this pollutant since the 70s. So here's the 1970s. Notice how it's going down. 
It's easy for the government to regulate sulfur than it is to regulate nitrogen. This is because the primary source is from large power plants, where the nitrogen's primary source is from cars, which are billions of individual tiny sources. So we're comparing one large source versus several tiny sources. It's easier to control the one large source. You'll notice that in the second graph, the transportation, which is down here, the light blue color has expanded in the last 70 years. I'm sorry, this is it here. This is fuel combustion. This is transportation. In the last 70 years, it's really grown. This is due to all the individual driving cars. It is much harder to regulate millions of individual cars than it is to regulate thousands of power plants. This is why there is really not a decrease in the nitrogen oxides. Asteroid can cause many damages depending on the materials. Buildings, cars, and other items become deteriorated with, by the acid rain. It also causes additional health issues for those who with asthma and bronchitis. It can injure the plant, injure the plant and animal life of surface waters and forests. To examine the chart more closely is located on page 267 in your book. This is an example of how statues can be affected by acid rain. Notice the breakdown in the marble and limestone slowly dissolved by the presence of the extra hydrogens. So here's the original limestone, calcium carbonate. With the extra hydrogen, it breaks down. If you walk down, around downtown Chicago and check out some of the older buildings, you will definitely see a lot of examples of this. Another issue is the rust that you can see on cars, buildings, bridges, and ships. Iron metal is exposed to hydrogen ions. You get the Fe2+, and that's what rust is. So Fe2+, then reacts with oxygen and water, and the Fe2O3 is that rust color. The iron metal in these items dissolves when exposed to hydrogen ions and then react further to produce rust. On the lower left of this slide, you will see the exact same view at two different times. On a very hazy day, you can only see 20 miles, whereas a fairly clear day, you can see over 100 miles. The haze seems to be more evident in summertime because of the increase in sunlight. The sunlight speeds up the chemical reactions that make the haze. The sulfur dioxide combines with water droplets and other particles in the air, and this makes kind of a foggy haze that's hard to see through. So this would be like in the summertime, while this is in a cooler part of the year. When you can see the haze, you're most likely breathing it in as well. Remember that all these pollutants and acids that enter, these are all pollutants and acids that are then entering your lungs. More and more regulations are being put into effect to reduce the haze in air population. Air pollution. Humans are not the only ones experiencing the effects of acid rain and, rain and air pollution. The lakes and streams are also feeling the effects. Normal aquatic life live in water with more than with the more basic pH between 6.5 and 9.5. With more acid in the water, the aquatic ecosystems are diminishing. Earlier we discussed how the oceans are able to regulate the pH, but, the, but are starting to see the results of the increasing acids. The lakes and streams are harder to regulate because they are smaller and feel a greater effect. Soils, soils around some of the lakes have the ability to resist the changes in pH. These are called the acid neutralizing capacity. For instance, calcium carbonate in the limestone in the Midwest 
provide a resistance to the acid. Other areas are not so lucky. The lakes are surrounded by harder rocks that do not break down as easily. These lakes are feeling the greater effects of the acid rain. Efforts are being made to neutralize the acidity, but some lakes are recovering while others are not.